A very warm welcome to the session that we have today. My name is Louise Rebender. I am director at Exponential Roadmap Initiative, and we are going to have a session that is called Transition Plans and the Net Zero Operating Space for Business, which is an incredibly interesting topic. Um, because businesses need to transform, there's a lot of talk about transition plans and there's talk about net zero targets, but can we actually imagine what the future will look like? Do we know what is required from companies in that future? And backtracking to here, do we know what it should look like in between this transition planning? And that's what companies need to do today in order for us to, to reduce the emissions that we need to do, halving by 2030 and moving towards net zero. So we will have a fantastic panel sitting here waiting. Uh, but I want to first introduce a colleague of mine, Claire Wig, Head of Climate Performance Practice at Exponential Roadmap, to set the scene a little bit and introduce what Exponential Roadmap Initiative is doing when it comes to transition plans and net zero operating space. Brilliant. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be able to tell you some of the things we've been doing today. But first of all, about Exponential Roadmap Initiative, we're a collaborative climate initiative with 30 large corporate members. Um, with the mission of accelerating climate action so that collectively we reach the net zero goal and the 1.5 degree ambition. So you might be aware that we're in the age of transition plans. About 20 years ago we were talking about greenhouse gas accounting and then about 10 years ago we began talking about target setting for corporates. Now the focus is on transition plans to get things done. And actually, I was hearing this morning that there's an exponential growth, which is great, in the number of transition plans that are being written by corporates and disclosed. So at Exponential Roadmap Initiative, we have been asking ourselves two questions. What does a good transition plan look like? And how can we help companies to write the ones that will get us this transformation that we need? We've been looking at it from various angles with various activities over the last year. But I'd like to start with uh, where we started, which is in the business playbook, this document, where we, uh, for about three years ago, outlined uh, the concept of the four pillars of climate action. And the first thing we would say about transition plans is they need to cover all four pillars. And those pillars are your operational emissions, that's usually called scope one and two, your value chain emissions, that's called scope three. And then the third pillar, that's where it starts to get perhaps more transformational, is about the impact of your products and services and whether they're actually serving this transformation. And then the fourth one is about your impacts in wider society. So where we started from a year ago was that a climate transition plan should cover all those four pillars. But then we found that our companies who are members of our initiative, they wanted more detailed guidance. That wasn't enough. So we started looking around and we got asked by the UN Climate Action Team to help them find some transition plans that, con that conformed to something called the UNHLEG Integrity Matters Report. And last year, up to Climate Week here in New York, uh, they published an implementation checklist, which was a checklist literally, what a transition plan should include. So we help some companies do that. But as you may also be aware, there's a proliferation of guidance on transition plans. And that was, we had our playbook, we then had this HLA guidance, um, but everybody is writing guidance about transition plans. So we decided to try and put it together. And so we did a bit of a mapping. We looked at 12 guidance and uh, regulatory documents and worked out which ones were covering what topics, what were they asking for from companies in transition plans. We found that largely there was quite a consensus. Uh, and to help our members, we produced a template, which is on our website, which is a way to organize the document itself. So it tells you what should be included and sets out a kind of narrative frame for actually putting it down on paper. And since then, we've been assessing our company's transition plans against that framework and giving them one-to-one -one feedback and also beginning to aggregate our findings, our analysis of what those companies' transition plans are strong on and weaker on. And we'll come back to the weaker, perhaps, in a bit. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to listen to the other struggles that our companies are having. So we've been doing interviews and workshops with some of the leading companies, including from Alpha Laval, who will join us here in a minute. Um, and we, had, we started off with some hypotheses. 
and I'll mention two today. We started off with the possibility, we wanted to check. We thought that maybe profit would be a concern when people started writing their transition plans. It's often not talked about in this climate space, but we thought might be, maybe it was worth raising. And then we, start, we had the hypothesis that plans needed ownership to be owned at the highest level in corporates in order for things to start happening for real and for the plan to be integrated in the overall business strategy so that the climate transition plan doesn't sit us alongside business strategy, but is part of the whole picture. So, we, as I say, we've been doing some interviews and workshops, and this is work in progress, but I can share three findings with you uh, today. So, first of all, the leading companies, they are writing serious plans. They're doing financial planning to underpin those plans, so they're, they're based in real work and real analysis of what's going to happen to their businesses in the coming years. They're involving the whole business in the process, down to business unit levels, so people who aren't usually talking about sustainability are being asked to work on this plan. And then the integration into strategy is happening in those leading companies, which is great. And we're finding that they are, it is, it is worthwhile, they say to us, that they ask themselves the question, how can we meet climate targets as well as being profitable? You have to be honest about that question. And if you are, the, these leading companies are telling us at least, then you find solutions. People get creative and opportunities for growth and revenue inc increases appear. So that was on the profit one. On the ownership side of the ownership of the plan, um, yes, we're being told that the plan needs to be owned at the highest level, preferably even board level, but at least executive management level, because that unlocks resources. Unless the mandate comes from the top, then people struggle to get the resources they need for the transformation. But a third finding, a bit separate to both of those, is that detailed planning is happening in the near term by which I mean to 2030. And we can understand why that is. Uh, people, all of us have difficulty thinking what we're going to be doing in 2040. But individuals see themselves in their posts in companies for the next few years possibly, but maybe not beyond. And the world is so uncertain, so people are finding it within corporates difficult to imagine that long-term future and transformation. And that's a problem, of course, because that means that some transition plans won't be addressing that transformation that we need. They'll be doing being incremental. How can we reduce our emissions by another 5%, another 3%, but not perhaps transforming the whole business? Because the time horizon is too short if you're looking only to 2030. On the other hand, it's good, because we need a laser focus on the near term, and we need to halve emissions by 2030. But we picked up on this question of longer term and more radical transformation, and we, tried to, we decided to have a think about how could we help companies envision this long term, given that it's hard. You know, how can we help give a paint a picture of it for businesses, which is essential to do to get that transformation going. And we came up with the concept, which is the title of this session today, the net zero operating space for business. And that operating space is constrained. We have to get down to pretty much zero greenhouse gas emissions. And at the same time, we need to meet the needs of all the people who will be living on this planet in 20 or 30 years' time. So starting from those two points, we looked at UNFCCC documents. We looked at the work by many others on human needs and on climate solutions. And we came up with four conditions which we think can help companies envision this future because they can define this net zero operating space for business. And they are circular. Everything in a business needs to be circular. Optimized. And that, by that we mean efficient use of all assets and all resources. And then renewable, so that's in terms of materials and energy. And then the fourth one is regenerative. So all the processes in a business need to give back more than they take. So circular, optimized, regenerative, and renewable. Um, we hope that this will inspire business leaders to think more transformatively, to maybe more creatively, maybe to inspire and be used with employees to get them to free up their minds a bit about how the business could look in future. But on a very practical level, at Exponential Roadmap Initiative, we're going to expect our member companies to begin setting key performance indicators on those four. 
We're not specifying exactly what they'll look like, but set some direction that will help you steer your business to be circular, optimized, renewable, and regenerative. So that's a bit of a whirlwind overview of what we've been doing. Some of the materials are out on our website. Some aspects and concepts we'll discuss in this panel. And we'll produce more uh, learnings later in the year. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. It uh, deserves an applause, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it is, it's, it is so much easier talking also to companies when it comes to transition plans and what they're doing to have a little bit of a definition of what it needs to look like in the future. But now we take up the rest of the panel and I introduce Anna Sel Singh, CSO of Alpha Laval. Welcome. And we have uh, Andrew Murray, Science and Futures Lead at Planeton. We have Sviram Rajakopal, Head of Climate and Air Pollution at IKEA. And we also have Aaron Kramer, President and CEO of BSR. A warm welcome and also an applause for this gang that we have here now. And, uh, unfortunately, Anna will have to leave in just a little bit. Uh, so we'll start with you. Um, and first of all, and I know Anna and Sri, you have been telling us what your companies do so many times, but very quickly, uh, what does your company do? And in terms of transition planning, um, uh, what are you doing then? I think I'd like to connect to what Claire said. Uh, we are very much a company in the sweet spot of having sustainable solutions, making the world more sustainable. Uh, we're a global company with 24,000 employees, uh, over 100 countries we're present in, and we provide technical solutions that are connected to heat transfer, separation, and fluid handling. And that enables, for example, the energy transition, clean energy, fuel cells, uh, carbon capture, long duration energy storage, but also plant-based food uh, and marine transportation. And uh, yeah, the, the list is very long as you hear, but clean water, I shouldn't forget either. Uh, and I think being in this position, we've said that we really need to do, do our job. We need to walk the talk to showcase the world that this is possible. So I can again reflect on what you said, Claire, that we have set targets on specifically those pillars that you mentioned, uh, renewables, efficiency, and uh, also circularity. We're not there yet on re -initive, but that's the next step. Uh, and we've done that by having what we called, because we, we went there before we had the term transition plans, uh, we called it roadmaps across our entire organization with accountability out in the organization to really reach our KPIs on these things that you mentioned, Claire, uh, to really track and also be transparent and uh, be transparent every quarter to the outside world also how we're progressing on our targets. So uh, we have, since we started our journey, more than halved our operational emissions. Uh, at the same time as we have also increased our turnover by over 50%. So that means that we actually decoupled our growth with, uh, from carbon emissions increasing. Uh, and that's quite something that we need to see in the rest of the world as well. And we've done that by energy efficiency, uh, using our own technology. We've, uh, in, uh, we offer circular uh, recycling of our products, so circularity is very important. We recycle over 100% of uh, water in water scarce areas um, in Middle East, for example, uh, and in China, India. So, so there's a lot ongoing and everything is tracked in what we call roadmaps, but now it's called more uh, transition plans. Uh, yes, a bit about our, our journey. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, and for Sri, the same question to you, a little bit about your company and then how are you working in terms of transition plans and reaching long-term uh, targets? So I'll take 20 seconds to just introduce the company. Uh, IKEA is a global home furnishings company. Uh, we have more than close to 475 stores around the world. We have restaurants in each of the stores. So we are also one of the world's largest restaurant companies as well, which is a bit counterintuitive if you think about it. Our, we take a value chain approach. So we have impact from materials, food ingredients, how we man convert our materials into finished products at our supplier factories, how we ship them to our stores or DCs, 
how do we sell our products in the stores, consumer buying our products, plugging it into their wall sockets, which also results in emissions, like ovens or microwaves, and then there is an end of life emission as well. So we've set, so we take a totality approach. So as of FY23, our overall emissions were 24 million tons across the whole value chain, CO2 equivalent. And that's almost bigger than the size of some uh, countries like Lithuania, for example, just to give a scale perspective. So uh, we have big responsibilities. We are part of the problem, and we need to be a part of the solution. In November 2022, we went to the board with our proposal of a transition plan, and uh, we did not have detailed uh, action plans to back it, so it was rejected by the board because there was a sense of, you know, how are we going to deliver to this halving of emissions? So we went back to each part of the value chain that I just alluded to, and the business owned the actions. How will they transform the business for each part where they sit in and move towards 2030 and get to a halving of the emissions? And based on that, we went back to the board last year in November, and we got an approval for our net zero goals. So we, for us, the roadmaps was a precondition for having our net zero goals approved. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sri. Um, uh, and well done. Um, and well done by the board, I, I think, as well, to, to, to reject something and then you replan and uh, focus. And uh, yeah, that's a fantastic story. And I just want to mention one thing. Yeah. So we are committed to halving emissions by 2030, FY30, and we will get to net zero by FY50. Okay. And we will do that without the use of offsets. Mm, all right. Thank you. Um, so going over to you, uh, Aaron. A little bit also about, about your company, what it does, but um, where you, you, you hear a lot of what companies are doing and how they're, they're working. What are the challenges in setting uh, plans beyond these short-term interim targets uh, towards net zero that you see? Thank you. Um, so at BSR, we are a global nonprofit business network and consultancy focused on just and sustainable business, working on climate and nature, also uh, the social issues, also the G issues, I'm not using that acronym today or maybe ever again. Um, um, it's been a period of intense learning, I think we can all agree. And in fact, I've been here at Climate Week hearing uh, about a lot of the successes but also the travails that companies have faced in delivering on their goals. And I, I'm, I was saying to a couple people before we got started, I can't decide if I should be depressed that people are pulling back a bit or pleased that there is, I think, a higher level of experience and maturity in the process because, um, and, and you, Claire, you described it very well, there's a lot of very important learning going on and companies are finding that some things are easier and faster than anticipated. We are seeing um, some really delightful growth in access to uh, renewable energy in many parts of the world, but some things are stubbornly difficult. And so I, I want to focus a little bit on some of the dependencies and uncertainties that I think are clearer to companies now, perhaps, than they were at the start of the 2020s. And of course, we've had a lot of surprises in this decade, hopefully none since we all sat down 17 minutes ago or whenever it was. Um, but I think we've learned a lot about scope three, some of the challenges that are present in delivering on on those goals because access to renewable energy in many different parts of the world simply isn't available the way we'd like. We have surprises like the uh, extreme growth of AI, which is very energy hungry, um, as well as the, the fact that energy markets were uh, totally disrupted when Russia invaded Ukraine. We have a lot of political and geopolitical uncertainty. So I won't go on because I don't want to depress people, but I think in terms of the transition plans, I think it's, it's important to hit the sweet spot between the ambition that we know that we need um, and also a degree of humility and pragmatism in terms of the, the things where we don't know what the answers are. Um, or we know that there may be surprises that, that come along the way. And I think some transition plans, and I'm not sure we've analyzed them as closely as you have, Claire, but um, they, they sometimes embrace a little bit of happy talk and assume that 
um, the, that the conditions will be ripe for progress that is maybe more linear than I think experience tells us progress will be. So I think we have to build that in. Um, the last thing I'll say um, is I want to pick up on something you said, Anna, uh, the bit about decoupling growth yeah. and emissions. Super important. Exactly. Um, and I think a lot of companies are really struggling with that right uh, yeah, now. Yeah, definitely. The, the investors demand growth right yeah. now. Um, we might talk a little bit. We were, we were in a meeting yesterday about this very question. Um, but it's really hard, therefore, for the leadership of a company, a board, the C-suite, to deliver on the growth that investors expect um, without you know, wreaking havoc on, on the climate goals that we know we need. That's a, a, an elephant in the room, if you will. Mm. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, now we will go to someone that may actually have the answers of the future. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure, Andrew. Uh, Andrew, please let us know a little bit about Planeton um, and also why is it so important to use future as a perspective when doing this? Sure. I mean, I'll go back again to what Claire said at the beginning. She wants to go, we want to go to business leaders and have them imagine a world that's regenerative, optimized, renewable, uh, and the, all those other elements. But that right now is kind of science fiction. That is a story that doesn't exist yet. Uh, and I think that often the future can really help us to experiment and explore the limits of what that actually means and how are we, what does that actually feel like and smell like and taste like in that future where we've actually done that. And at Planethon we really sort of help uh, companies to combine imagination and action, science and storytelling and actually explore this space because it's deeply uncomfortable. It's full of all sorts of emotions that we don't want to feel. It requires different kinds of like really transformations, not only in business models, but how we operate as employees in a company or whatever it might be. But of course, if you just tell stories about the future, if you just envision what this world is, and that is kind of in a different way decoupled from science on the one hand or decoupled from the realities that business face, that doesn't work either. Mm -hmm. So an equally important part is yes, you em envision this future and then you work back and say, okay, if we can see what this renewable, circular, uh, optimized company would be, then how do we get back to where we are today? And how do we link the transition plans with that? It's a constant conversation between the future and the present. And I think the other important part about this is assuming that everyone is just ready to do this right now is, is challenging. Anyone can engage in the future, but it is a process of upskilling and training. So a really important part of this is futures literacy. How do you build capacity of leaders to be able to kind of anticipate and feel comfortable with all this uncertainty? Because if you just keep throwing uncertainty at people and don't give them any skills to actually manage or navigate that, uh, then you're not really doing any help. So I think that's the key. It's combining all of those things together uh, in a way that can really sort of support uh, leaders both where they're going and where they are right now. Mm -hmm. I have some more questions, but I want to check with Anna. Yeah. Any reflections there? Uh, it's super important. I mean, it's uh, as you were saying, it's changing all the time. So you have to lead with integrity in that changing world. And the list of challenges is endless. Uh, and I mean, just. We have 97% renewables, but to get that last 3% uh, is super hard because it doesn't exist on the markets uh, that we try to find it at. Uh, we have so many things that are about circularity where I really think we need to envision what the future looks like because that's going to be creating ecosystems where we exchange materials and material networks across sectors. Uh, and that's really uh, something to reimagine our our value chains and that's why I think scenario planning is super important so we can get together around those scenarios all these partners that needs to uh, yeah that's just a reflection how good are we at envisioning the future maybe you Andrew I mean this has probably been said many times and we're in the solutions house so I'll say it again. but uh, it's a lot easier to imagine uh, dystopia than, than positive visions but of course positive utopian visions even though those are also uh, can be difficult to imagine it's even harder when you actually take into serious consideration the stakes that we're facing and the kind of constraints they're putting on by the changes in the earth system uh, climate tipping points and things like that so it is really hard to envision uh, these kind of futures that are pr 
preferable, they're ones we want to go to world, they take into account human well-being and, and a just transition and prosperity uh, and actual circular flows and, and regenerative our ability to give back to ecosystems. That's many, many different things that you need to kind of put in those future visions. So it is really, really hard. But I think that uh, you know the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance is, is part of this group. There's a lot of move within Hollywood and storytellers and different things, and there are many, many uh, different organizations and people mobilizing, I think, around this challenge. So I think the tools that companies have available now uh, to engage in this in a really serious way, and, and I think it's also companies need to be bold enough to explore telling really complex, difficult stories that aren't just you know superficial, that everything went great. It's being able to tell you know, really uh, stories that have many different kinds of uh, layers to them. And I think that's where the supportive storytellers and, and others can be really, really powerful. If I could add, it's a great question, and I think the answer is um, it's both challenging and very doable. So um, we did, and I, I say this not to advertise our work, but, but just to illustrate, we produced a report last week that was a mid-decade update of some doing business scenarios on doing business in 2030. And what we found was that some of the things that we envisioned in scenarios in, at the end of 2018 actually evolved as we thought they might. The, the disconnection between China and the West in terms of economic models, and maybe it wouldn't have taken a genius to see that, but we, we, we played out the implications of that. And then there are other things that are much harder to predict. Nobody really, as I say, could have predicted the invasion of Ukraine. Certainly we knew that uh, a, a pandemic could happen, but we didn't know when. We, we didn't know how, how things would be handled. Uh, and then I think the social implications of various things are also are due. The, the one thing I would say is that the fact that it's um, an art, not a science, is all the more reason to do it, number one. And number two, what I would say to companies is we've seen sometimes companies um, reduce this, the degree to which they take seriously the, the scenarios that raise the most uncomfortable questions. So I think, you know, have the courage to consider what some of these scenarios are, even if they raise some pretty fundamental questions about business model and so on. You like climate change, that is an uncomfortable topic. So let's not think about it. I think yeah. that's what some people are yeah. thinking. Yeah, Claire. I, I was just going to say that I tend to be um, not terribly optimistic, and I'm not very good at imagining the future. So I'm, I'm the person who sits and writes standards and things like that. So, so thank you to the storytellers. But I think that was the idea with the net zero operating space, was we're not actually envisioning anything for a company. We're trying to give them the framework in which to envision them, their future themselves. So we were just trying to say, what direction do you need to go in and what's the space that you'll have to play in? And if you can put then they can envision themselves in that space and hopefully find their future. Yeah, so regardless of what they sell, how they sell it, or if they, whatever they do, yep. they need to think about those four criteria. Yeah, that's yep. what we, we're, we, it's a thought piece, yep. but that's what we've put out, yeah. Yep. Um, uh, so uh, if I go, yeah, uh, we can thank Anna uh, because she had to leave. Uh, but we continue with three, maybe uh, the biggest challenges and blockers that you see uh, in your sector for both envisioning and transitioning um, to that future state. I think there are multiple challenges. Uh, firstly, the solutions are there, but they are not there at the cost points where we need them. So we don't want sustainable solutions to be the prerogative of the few or a luxury good. We need to make them available to the many. And that's the challenge on how do we allocate our, or develop a portfolio which accounts for that. So that's one of the biggest challenge that we operate with. And then there are different challenges in each part of our value chain, like materials, for example. Uh, we want to move towards using only recycled or renewable materials. But access to renewable materials is also a challenge. You know, we need to build massive recycling infrastructure around the world to make these raw materials available so that you know, we can have these circular loops in flow. Uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, food ingredients that we use in terms of, and now we want to move towards more regenerative farming. And there is a question on, you know, 
where will the financing? Financing is one of the main questions which is on the table because the impact of moving towards regenerative farming is not on day one. But how, and we also work with a lot of small farmers as well, you know, so how, who supports them and what is the mechanism there? Uh, and then in transportation, for example, uh, for ocean transport, we don't have an electrified electrification today. So we are doing, we are looking at the low-hanging fruits. You know, can we put more of our trans, uh, more of our goods on rail for the uh, intermodal transport? So longer distances on the rail, and then we will have the last mile and the first mile as such. Or looking at efficiency as a measure or even in production, for example. In many of the industries, we sell glass, we sell ceramic products, and we don't have electrification options there as well. And green hydrogen, there is a lot of discussion about green hydrogen, but when we scratch the surface, in the countries that we operate in, the infrastructure is not available. So we need all of these to scale up across. Uh, so on infrastructure, materials as such, in terms of financing, there's a lot of things that need to be pinned down but one fundamental aspect is the cost aspect, which uh, really, yeah, that needs to be uh, kept in mind as well. And then we also need to have uh, those companies that go in the forefront there to show, show what is possible uh, in the this different certain areas and, and uh, with new innovations and new ways of working and so on. Yes. Um, but um, Aaron, maybe opportunities and successes that you've seen? Well, I, and I think that, um, again, in, in many parts of the world, we, we've seen the rapid increase in the availability of, of clean energy. I think the agreement at COP uh, last year, while you know, some people would have preferred more decisive language, was an acknowledgement of something very, very important. I think uh, those are all good. I'm personally pleased by the fact that a just and inclusive transition is now being addressed much more widely than it was. It was sort of the concept that would not be named for a very long time, and now it's front and center on the agenda. I think there are uh, there is some progress on uh, climate finance. A lot more is needed. So I, I think, and this is, again, I, I, I'm walking around Climate Week feeling a little bit bipolar in, in, in trying to decide whether uh, there's good reasons for optimism or whether we should be in despair. But I think, I think we have to celebrate these advances. I think the level of, to get a little more uh, practical, boards of directors are dealing with climate uh, no pun intended, exponentially more often than they used to be. I mean, it's really remarkable, and there's a long ways to go. But I, we could spend our whole, you know, our whole time here, I think, going over the things that are going well. There are many of them. The barriers are real, but there is a good deal of progress. I, I think I'd like to add that when we've talked to a few, a handful of leading companies, I was so encouraged to find that the profit question went away in that once they put it out on the table within the organization and delegated the question to people who run things, business units, those people came up with solutions and they were uncovered. And that was a real eye-opener to me that this was, they were concerned at first, but they found their way through. I don't know, maybe Sri, you'd like to comment? Yeah, that I was can. Good. And with challenges comes opportunities, and mm -hmm. you saw that. And what we've seen in our example is that the business has become more entrepreneurial in nature. So, you know, now it's more of a portfolio approach that you need to work with. So in some cases, you can work with more, let's say, a cost of a product. The material cost is usually, in our case, the highest cost. So can we play with different materials? Can we lower the cost? Can we be more efficient using the same material, for example? And we can harvest some cost out in that sense. And then there are other places where we, can, we need to take more costs. But it can't be on a product level, but on a portfolio level, uh, what we usually operate is on, you know, for example, plastics overall. So in the plastic portfolio, what can you do when? What are opportunities for cost savings? What are, where do we need to take the cost? And on an overall level, what is the cost impact? So it's not as big as we thought it would be. So it's also how to allocate costs and yeah, essentially portfolio management is uh, really key at every part of the value chain. So 
Uh, now I get curious, uh, see what do, you, what do you think? Do you think companies or people in companies are good to envision the long term perspective? Maybe within your company or in general in your sector? I think we need to have one eye on the long, long run. But right now as a company speaking from IKEA's perspective, we are really razor focused on the 2030 goal yeah. right now. Because that in itself is quite a challenge in itself. So we don't have, uh, so as, uh, just to put things into context, so we have committed to 50% reduction. We are at 22% reduction as of FY23. But we have harvested all the low hanging mm -hmm. fruits. Now it's the tougher things on the table that we need to manage. So in the next five years, we are really gunning for, and as I said, we have a plan in place, climate roadmaps to deliver to those goals. A lot of, in a lot of areas, we have really pinned down 100% of what we need to deliver. In some cases, like materials, we still have a gap, which is an innovation gap, which, we con which the business teams continue working on super hard. Uh, but on the other hand, we can't take our eyes beyond, uh, you know, off on the long-term picture as well. Like, for example, we have commitments going beyond 2030 as well. For example, we have committed to zero emission vehicles in ocean, uh, you know, complete electrification of ocean transport by 2040. So there are areas which are a bit more clearer. And then we, we are very optimistic that there would be technologies which would come on the way, which would make the path between 2030 and 2050 uh, much more uh, precise on what we can do. And we wouldn't need to set those goals five-year goals beyond 2030 as well. And what about you, Andrew? How, how do you see, um, how, what reactions do you see when you're, when you're talking about these um, future visions with, uh, with different stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's naturally kind of an initial reaction is often that, okay, but we, the concern that if we focus too far in the future, we'll lose, like take our eye off the ball on the, on the near future. Uh, and one way I often try to respond to that initial hesitation is say that the far future can help you to see the near future in a different way. Um, it's like if you're a mouse in a labyrinth, right? You're going through and you're trying to find the cheese, which is the net zero transition space or operating space. And you go through and you keep running into a wall. And every time you come into a wall, you have to decide whether you go around the wall, climb over the wall, knock it down, can you find a route through. But you, as the mouse, don't have the picture of what the labyrinth looks like. So you don't actually know whether you're going to find cheese or fall into a horrible hole full of spikes. And I think the far future can really help you to see the whole labyrinth while also trying to get to the cheese and making sure you avoid the traps. Because there are many, many traps uh, that the future will continue to kind of lay for us, just in the same way that there's many opportunities. Um, and I think the other thing is the, the and, and I think when we sort of talk about that, uh, that relationship again between the, the present, the near future, and the far future, that uh, helps people to be more comfortable with exploring these things. Um, and the other thing is I think that, you know, you mentioned uncomfortable ideas and these kinds of different things. And I think it's very difficult to deal with those in the near future. A lot of companies and people are very invested in their own position, uh, in the short-term profitability of the company. And they can't go into a situation where they can immediately be super radical in the short term. But the long term means that you can be much more sort of experimental. For example, we're talking right now about overshoot, right? The fact that we may need to overshoot uh, the 1.5C target, and then in the future we'll be able to take more carbon out of the atmosphere and then we'll come back in. That is a wild bit, right? And we don't even know if that will work or how many climate tipping points we're going to cross. But you can experiment with different kinds of ideas. What about economic undershoot? What about in the far future of companies kind of invested coming together as a giant alliance to actually say for the next 10 years we're going to act like startups and we're not going to take any revenue and all of our profit we're going to pour into investing. We're going to push back against the kind of financial markets and things and say no, uh, we're going to kind of make this historic Marshall Plan scale investment uh, to be able to get to this kind of transformative state. So while still working on the incremental. And that might not be something that is even possible, but exploring the idea can mean that maybe you can do a, some version of that which actually allows you to then speed up the incremental pace. We're talking about exponential roadmap, right? That exponential change, it's 30 steps, exponential steps, and you're at Mars. So if we're thinking about a transformation of getting to Mars, uh, then you need to be able to kind of be radical uh, and incremental at the same time. 
And we need to get all the ideas on the table, really. Yeah. Whatever they are. Um, so, uh, Claire, how do you think people will, or those that read uh, about these four criteria, how will they react, or how have they reacted? Well, so far, we've been working with five or six leading companies, and Alpha, Laval, and IKEA were chosen because they were further ahead, so you're seeing the best examples. Um, but we see companies that we work with in general trying to find the levers in terms of key performance indicators that will give them the, the reductions in emissions that they want. Because just sitting, you know, greenhouse gas is a greenhouse gas, it's an invisible they're invisible gases. So often it's quite hard to envisage exactly how to reduce. But if you can find the lever in terms of circularity, optimization, regeneration, and renewable, then those can help steer the organization. And that's where we're finding people open to the idea. Is there anything missing today in how, how things should be done? when it comes to either applying the criteria or transition planning in your perspective? Well, transition planning in general, we're, we're lacking thinking on the just transition piece. Um, and I think organization, apart from these leading companies, I think those conversations about financial planning need to get more real within the organization. And that requires that every part of an organization is involved in the planning. And that's what we see in the leading companies. Yes, and, and that's something I, I often think about. Is, are the needed parts involved? And you said now, maybe yes, with the leading companies. How, how, what does it look like with the not so leading companies, whoever they may be? Well, that's a good question. I just see their plans. I haven't. Uh, I need to talk to them to find out how their plans evolved. But uh, the lead, by the leading ones, I mean the ones who have credible looking, comprehensive, well worked through transition plans that maybe are even their second iteration now. So they've done one plan, moved on, and they're in their second iteration. So those are the ones that I've been looking at. Yeah, and we need to take those learnings to the others, which is what we're trying to do. Mm, and now I get into this interesting topic of internal engagement and alignment. What about you, Aaron? How do you see that we have internal alignment um, well, working I'm with this? I'm going to borrow Andrew's vision of a whole with sharp sticks at the bottom. I think that will focus people's minds very well. Um, I, I don't think that, by and large, companies have um, joined up internal alignment. And the reality is, not to be a downer, but the leading companies are very small, right? Mm -hmm. the, the vast number of enterprises don't have that, are facing a lot of different cross pressures, et, et cetera, et cetera. I think that um, uh, public policy is part of the solution to that. I think that. The reporting and disclosure laws have, have uh, a number of uh, unintended and, and not ideal consequences. However, it's laying a consistent foundation around the world that is causing companies to ask more or less the same questions that include questions about the economic viability, the technological viability, uh, the, the you know, investor and consumer interest. So I think that's helping to lay a foundation that um, I think will increase the degree of, of internal alignment. But the reality it is, is that even the most ambitious companies face uh, investors who are sending mixed messages and consumers who are sending mixed messages. And it's hard, even if you have philosophical alignment inside uh, company leadership, if the people you sell to, the people you employ, the people who provide your capital are not speaking consistently, by definition, that alignment is going to be challenged. So I think these, these are the realities. They, they can all be transcended. Uh, they can't be transcended overnight. Uh, but um, I, think, I think wrestling with those realities, which most companies are doing now, I think, again, is a sign of growing maturity in, the, in, in, in this world that we're, we're living in. Yeah, and since we are at Solutions House and the, it's answers only, so if we just turn this around, uh, because when we do get internal alignment, we, we're pairing procurement with R&D and with sales, you can get quite a lot of magic, you know, you see great things happening. So turning this around from, from a challenge uh, to something that is a great opportunity for companies to, to focus on, and also bringing in the, the aspect of profit into this and, uh, yeah. Uh, so, Aaron, we met yesterday. 
Mm. We, uh, you were hosting a roundtable. Did you get any good insights from that uh, roundtable, which was on a kind of a similar topic? Thank you. Um, it was. It was about the um, the. The interplay of growth, which is an imperative in the system that we have right now, and actual reductions, not relative reductions, actual reductions, because this is a big dilemma for a lot of companies. I think the I was pleased by the level of interest in this topic, um, which I think 24 months ago, I'm not sure would have been about the same. So that's very good. People are asking the questions, which of course is a, a first step. Um, when it comes to this question and the way to get business model innovation, you very quickly realize that you have to look at this industry by industry, you know, product and service by product and service, and to some degree, um, geography by geography, because if we were having a conversation about the dilemmas of growth in an economy where most of the world's people live and where access to goods and services is limited, it, it, it's a different conversation. But I think it's important that this be put on the table, and I, I'm pleased that um, it is starting to be uh, in a good way, and if we had every board aligned on the fact that this was a legitimate topic to explore, and companies were, you know, including this not only in their transition action plans but in their reporting on an annual basis, we would start to see a virtuous circle emerge. I would hope. So we're coming to to the end here, but uh, quite quickly because I have two questions. One for Claire, and that is the next steps for uh, our work at the Exponential Roadmap Initiative with transition plans. Yes, so we're going to continue interviewing and discussing with those leading companies, so we can draw learnings from them to put out into the wider business community. And as I say, we're going to be asking our, all our members to be setting key performance indicators on circularity, optimization, renewable, and regenerative practices. All right. And then uh, we have uh, the question here uh, about what uh, is something that is absurd in the present uh, from the perspective of the future? And we start with you, Andrew. Sure. So I'm going to choose the linear throughput economy. So I'm sitting in 2050, I'm a school student, and I speak to my AI assistant, Ariel, and I say, hang on, wait, 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 one sec. Just one second. You're telling me that what they used to do is extract, just extract everything out of it, then dump it back into the planet and just do this forever? And they thought that was an economic model. You just extract and take everything out, dump it back in, and that nothing bad would ever happen and it would just continue forever. You mean they didn't have a circular economy from the beginning? Why? That's madness. And then they're going to go and, uh, and get back to uh, playing um, the future version of video games. But that's, for me, the absurdity. <laughs> yeah. I think resonate quite a bit with Andrew here. Uh, <laughs> I think reflections would be pretty much, you know, what were we really thinking? Because it's not only a question of, you know, it's, it's a question of societal resilience, business resilience, and uh, we are just, and we are so much integrated. We are part of nature, and we don't actually behave the way that we do uh, today. And it would, looking back in time, and also what, for example, you touched upon circular renewables as such. You know, why were we not using, why, was, why were we signing off on our own demise as a civilization by subsidizing fossil fuels, for example, and not phasing out fossil fuels completely, removing fossil fuel subsidies. So I think there will, all, uh, there will, uh, there will, all, there will be these reflections uh, in the future. Yeah, I think you're going to have to have a 10 second answer for that one. The fact that we are also susceptible to misinformation. Oh. Mm. Good one. We we'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Leave it there. Mm -hmm. But I want to say something too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about uh, the treatment of nature. I'm a little bit skeptical if we will accept it in the future. Okay, but that was it for, uh, for this panel. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored to be here with you. We have Claire Wig and we have Anna who already left. And we have Sri, Andrew and Aaron and we have a big applause for that. Thank you. Thank you.